um, very interested in exploring with our panelists the experience that the exhibition has been proliferating over the last five months. And as you know, the exhibition is ongoing until almost the end of the year and what we also envision. But before we delve into that, let's get to know our panelists. So let's start with you, Conrad. Can you introduce uh, yourself to us? Um, yes, um, so I'm Conrad Shawcross. I'm the artist who, uh, who made the works in the show. I studied at Oxford um, in the late 90s. I studied at the Ruskin and um, I was very happy um, at Oxford and I, I had a sort of really very, very, very um, positive experience. Um, I had wonderful tutors um, and I, uh, I learned a lot, but I, what I also the, the structure of the university was so is in a way informed this idea for the show in that I, we were spread very thinly and we still are the uh, Ruskin. There's one artist in every college. And uh, so we're spread very thinly and slightly, and we're sort of slight, sit quite uncomfortably within the colleges because we don't study in the colleges. The art, Ruskin is autonomous within the art school, but we're this sort of slightly, these sort of agitators within each college that ask questions and no one no, quite knows why we're there and why art is it academic or is it just a sort of, uh, a, it always sits a little bit weirdly within all the other subjects. And, uh, and we always go off in the day, but then we come back at night and we're sort of, it's, but I, I found that very exciting to be there because all my friends were obviously the artists, but I had made friends with all writers and, and people study English and history and science. And so I, all of these, I was exposed to all of these subjects, but one of the things I regret is not going to enough lectures beyond my, my the sort of, um, the, the, the lectures that were sort of dictated at the art school. And so I sort of did go to a few and they were always revelatory. And my friend would take me to a lecture and I loved that. And, um, and I think one of the, the essences of this show is to try and take people into the math department who, who wouldn't maybe find uh, it scary or foreboding or not appropriate or intimidating. And just like you, uh, the mathematicians may not want to go to the art school, but it's to try and encourage these sort of um, these migrations. And I think one of the things that was quite funny, I think we all probably feel a bit like imposters tonight. And we were last night, I was telling Dyroll that I was nervous about being talking in this context. And he said, well, that's exactly how James and Martin feel. <laughs> that we all feel like imposters because I don't, I'm, I'm, talk, I'm talking in, a, in an area which I fit, it's not my expertise and, and vice versa. But I think that's the whole point that we're trying to go outside of our comfort zones. And actually, when, when one is outside one comfort zone, one can be one's most creative. And it's in these kinds of moments that actually when real discovery and real kind of progress, things can be made. Thank you very much. So James, could we also uh, hear from you? And maybe if you can also tell us about what you do. Sure, yeah, I'm James Sparks. I'm head of the Mathematical Institute uh, here. It's a job that I took over at the start of September last year. Uh, it's been a very busy six months so far, as I was telling Fatosh before we started today. Um, it's a hugely enjoyable and rewarding job, though. Um, so when I get some spare time, I also do research. Um, I've been faculty here for the last 15 years. I'm a member of the Mathematical Physics Group. Um, so my research, I'd say, lies between theoretical physics and geometry, and I'm particularly interested in the overlap of those two subject areas. I think sort of growing up as a young kid, I was particularly excited by physics, and I remember doing a project on the planets when I was about nine or ten years old, and uh, that's what particularly excited me. And I think I was always very interested in, in physics, despite choosing mathematics as a degree. Um, and I thought I wanted to do cosmology, uh, actually. I know cosmology is also one of your uh, inspirations and sort of universe and those sorts of ideas, Conrad, you've mentioned that before. Um, but then as a PhD student, actually, I got very interested in geometry. And um, so it, it took a slightly different direction at that point. Um, but the relation between the two, and they very much come together in, in general relativity, uh, so that Einstein's theory of gravity mm -hmm. is where those two intersect with each other. Um, so yeah, that's kind of my, that's my research area in a nutshell. Um, I'm also an amateur musician, so uh, I've played the organ since the age of 11 or so. Um, 
I was very much into composing as a young kid. I guess I ran out of time for doing that, but I was really interested in the creative process um, in music and how that was related to maths. And that's something I've given talks about too, um, including a public talk here. Um, so I am, I'm very much interested in mathematics and how it's related to arts and, and the creative processes. Thank you. This is so very inspiring, actually, and can't wait to kind of read the exhibition all together. So, Martin, we met uh, during the installations and you were very busy organizing the clay conference. Could you please introduce us yourself? Yeah, thank you. So, um, hello, everyone. I'm Martin Brideson. Um, I'm the Whitehead Professor of Pure Mathematics here at the Mathematical Institute in Oxford. Um, I'm also president of the Clay Mathematics Institute, as has just been said. So, um, as president of the Clay Mathematics Institute, uh, my, my main function is to, to promote and facilitate, um, enable and disseminate mathematics at the highest level. And it just struck me listening to what other people were saying, actually, that uh, uh, the, the mission statement of the Clay Mathematics Institute, which is something I very much like, is to promote the beauty, power, and universality of mathematics, which I think are three themes that uh, actually go, go rather well with this idea of cross-fertilization this evening. Um, when I'm not being president of the Clay Mathematics Institute, um, I say I'm Whitehead Professor of Pure Mathematics, and my research interests are in geometry, topology, and group theory, which is usually summarized these days as geometric group theory. Now, those words may mean, some of those words may mean more to you than others. Um, to give you a sense of what I do, is I try and bridge um, between different fields of mathematics to, to, to form, <coughs> excuse me, fertile interactions, but particularly geometry is typically at one end of, of the bridge. So trying to recast problems from elsewhere in mathematics or science as geometric problems normally, so that you can think about them with geometric intuition and use the power of geometry. Um, and sometimes the other way around, sometimes you use calculus or algebra to, infor to, to inform you about geometric objects, but more often I'm looking to recast algebraic problems, for example, in geometry so that you can uh, approach them with geometric intuition. And in truth, that's probably how I approach most things in life. So um, I, I, I am one of the said imposters. I have no particular expertise whatsoever in art. Um, but I do have particular reactions to, to Conrad's work in particular, which is probably informed by this sensibility of, of wishing to see the world in a geometric way. Thank you, that was very beautiful. So perhaps we could actually um, um, talk a little bit about the exhibition. So maybe Conrad, let's start with you, like why Mathematical Institute, why now? Um, well, um, the, I mean, it was, it, it, the, I, I did a proposal here when the building opened maybe 10 years ago. I was introduced to the building because there was a, an idea of a piece in the atrium and I, I made a few sort of kind of quite daring ideas that were completely way beyond, I think, the sort of scope of the uh, budget at the time. I was proposing a kind of huge rope machine that would sort of weave an endless rope and be suspended from the ceiling. And it was, um, it was I think, while it may have come across quite impressive, it was completely unrealistic at the time and so I was slightly um uh yeah it was it was I overplayed my hand I think uh but um but it was just something we we remained in touch and it uh came out uh, came about and we it was something that uh was on the cards potentially before before lockdown and then we met and uh, realized we had this sort of affinity with mathematics and we decided and it sort of snowballed really and we um and then we met Dyerol, who's been really instrumental in it, and we sort of managed, everything sort of really sort of came together, and it started off with just a small show of some historic works, just had actually a massive survey of all the sort of works I've ever made with tetrahedron. So there's a sort of tetrahedral odyssey within the show as the sort of backbone of the show, but then there's works to do with interference patterns, and, um, and, and all of them, again, sort of alluding to sort of philosophical ideas. So it's that collision of... Um, geometry and philosophy that I sort of have a real fascination with and my I have this term that I create that I sort of use called psychogeometry which is um, uh, a sort of that which encapsulates that this idea that that geometry contains meaning but it may be elusive or it may every, everyone who sees it may see something different and I think the thing that I what I love about art is that it isn't definable that 
anyone who looks at a at a at a Matisse like the one outside or the uh, you, everyone will see something different. You can't dictate that, and you never will be able to dictate that based on your gender, on your culture, on your religion, on your education, on your love, your trauma. Everyone will see something different in that work, and it will create different neural pathways in your brain. And so everyone will have a new, a different neural response to that geometry or to that piece of art. And so seeing these works in this context with all these wonderful augmented minds, these mathematicians is so exciting to me because I have a reason why I made those, but it's not as interesting to me as the reason what people see in it, particularly. And so already we've had so many interesting responses from, from topologists and uh, quantum theorists about what they're seeing in terms of multi-dimensions. And a lot of it I don't understand, but I'm so excited by the fact that they see it. Thank you. Actually, if, I know Martin, because you were talking about your uh, passion for geometry. What would, what does psychogeometry walk in you? Or do you think this is also kind of like an artistic way of thinking about, you know, the multiple position, possibilities of reading something or engaging with something, whereas in mathematics, perhaps you don't have that much multitude or do you? I'm asking from like a kind of a, a speculative way, like what is the level of certainty and, and kind of like openness? And that, that, that's an interesting question. I, we, we do look for certainty. We're sort of rather obsessed with certainty and the proof of certainty. But it's certainly, I would say, um, what, what I think most professional mathematicians find most attractive about mathematics is just the vast amount of unknown and uncertainty about just the more you try to explore the, the mathematical universe, the more you realize how little we know and how many different interpretations there are of, of fundamental objects and how many different perspectives uh, there are on fundamental objects and how many different perspectives can be useful in attacking serious fundamental problems. Um, and in terms of uh, the art reflecting that, uh, I think it is, I, I, I must say, I particularly like um, the, the piece in, in, the eight, in the lobby as you come in, the, the schism, because um, for me that, you know, I, I could say on the one hand, it, it's illustrating the fact that tetrahedra don't fit together nicely to, to, to tile three-dimensional space. On the other hand, it has this, uh, this real artistic flair about um, the fact, yes, okay, something's almost there, but those cracks are full of potential. Uh, and, that, and that is somehow, in my mind, that, that's, a, that's a very inspiring reflection of, of, sort of my everyday life that, you know, if you're... If you're yeah, exactly, exactly that piece. Yeah, so, and it, so um, no, that somehow the pieces are sort of fitting together. You're trying to solve a hard problem. You're trying to approach it from all sorts of different perspectives. And in my mind, that, that, that's, a, that's really a, a provocative statement about that sort of thing. And of course, the, uh, the Conrad's put them together with, with great artistic flair to, to sort of bring, bring out a point that I would make in a much drier way. But that is the way I sort of think of the jumble of mathematical objects. You have half the story, you're trying to find the other half of the story to find the proof, to find the certainty, to discover the new phenomenon. Um, and so I, I find the openness of, of that work in particular, but many of the other works sort of inspiring in that way. I, I mean, it's interesting you brought that up and I, it's something I, I discovered this maybe 10 years ago when I was trying to build a, a sphere, but I was kind of, I was very bamboozled by the tetrahedron because when I first started using it 20 years ago, you, you kind of, it, it looks on its own as this epitome of order because it's made up of four equilateral triangles and it folds up to form this three-sided pyramid. And it, it, in Greek times, it was a symbol of the atom, this indivisible unit. And it, and it has this, it encapsulates this sense of, of, of simplicity and um, sort of oneness. But yet when you put them together, they become, it becomes chaotic, it becomes unruly, it's, it's ungovernable. And it's, it's incredibly surprising, this contradictory nature of it. But when I discovered this, I, like, um, I put it aside because it was sort of a failure. I sort of thought, hmm, that, was in, that kind of perplexed me. And I put it aside because I think this isn't working, it's not forming the icosahedron that I was hoping it would. But actually, it was only I was later that I realized that's what's for me as an artist. That's what's so interesting about it is it creates questions, not answers. It's not a model. It's not a successful model in that it doesn't answer questions. It asks questions. 
And so for me, an, an artwork, a good artwork will ask questions, a bit like the Susan Sontag thing. It's not there to, to, um, to sort of tell everyone the same thing. And so different people who see this will see, a, a theologian will see that God is mischievous. Uh, an, uh, an atheist will say that it proves there's no God. Some people say this proves that we're living in a simulation. Some people say it's because Europe's screwed. I mean, it's, um, it's, um, it's, uh, I mean there's lo loads of people, whatever your beliefs, you see, you see that in it. And it's, um, it's dystopic and it's kind of, it's called schism for a reason, because I like this idea that it's, it's, um, it's the sort of thing that Descartes wouldn't have showed to the king because he would have been beheaded, like that kind of thing. But would, would, that, would this thing be, is this is it something like this? Forget the art side. Is this something? You, would you ever see a model like this in a maths institute or in a in, a, in a, one of those glass cabinets? Is it useful to mathematicians, or is the failure just irrelevant? I, I, no, I was going to say I, this is also one of my favourite pieces too, and it 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 uh, for me it represents a lot of our time as mathematicians is kind of things that don't work or that you feel like that they should work, just as you described in your process of trying to fit the tetra and hedra together, and you, you find that it doesn't work. And you, sp you spend so much of your time as a mathematician struggling with things, trying to understand things, understanding really why things don't, don't work, and that, that leads to, you know, hopefully a resolution of, of, of understanding. So it's, I think it's a wonderful metaphor for for, for that, of, of sort of being, being stuck in trying to understand why, why something doesn't work or why something does work. No, no I wholeheartedly agree with that. And, uh, and also it, it provokes the question, well, in what context will it work? What do you have to do to make it work? For example, if you go to hyperbolic geometry and you push those vertices off to infinity, you get a very beautiful object where they do fit together. And uh, I think that's, that's the beginning of a lot of mathematical um, advances is just, okay, there's something that's just missing there. It's not quite in the right context. Uh, so what's missing? How can I fix it? In it? And then it doesn't have to be a unique answer to that, but it, it has that sort of provocative feel to it. Mm -hmm. this, is a, this is the big one that I made of that one. Uh, so the one outside is made of wood, um, but this one is in the south of France in a place called Chateau Lacoste, and it's a 6.5 meter one where, where there's one tetrahedron removed. So you can actually enter into the into the crack and sort of so it's a sort of there is a space a sort of a space inside it this was me with the i did this during lockdown um and it arrived all these planks of steel and there was no one to install it i drove out and got a license to do it and i trained these argentinian pizza chefs to help me put it together <laughs> so i've become the color of the steel because it was so uh, yeah but it was a lot of fun and it was very we had to use a lot of improvisation uh, but i i was told and this is a question for both of you a, a mathematician who I won't mention his name told me that there is a certain condition in the universe in which this, in terms of the curvature of space-time, that this, these, these cracks would not be there. And is that preposterous or is that the possibility? I suspect that's the hyperbolic thing I'm talking about. There is a condition. In, in a negatively curved universe, which we may or may not live in, that, that, that crack could... could close up at, if on a sufficiently large scale. Yeah, um, I think that's very beautiful. So good. <laughs> an artistic question. Mm. How long, so, so there are gaps, there have to be gaps, mm. but, but one can fiddle with the tetrahedra to put the gaps in all sorts of different places. Yeah. How long do you stare at it and fiddle with it? And are you always content that you've come to the optimal answer in some well, sense? Well, yeah, there's, so there's a, I don't know how many I guess it's 19 exclamation mark is the number of ways you can, or 20 exclamation mark, the number of ways you can put it together is in terms of um, uh, the, the, but every time you put it together, it forms a different crack. And, um, but there are, there are nicer ones than others and ones that it's all, of, this is all about the, the human experience. So the, the voids within it needed to be approached at sort of a, right around 1.4, 1.5 meters at eye height. So you can navigate that. You didn't want to have any spikes coming off at, at, a, dan at a dangerous height, which is between knee height and eye height. So there was all these sorts of things you have to take into account when you're making something at scale. But scale is really, is something that's very um, important with the way these works scale up. So if I go back to the, the original, these ones. This is the um, the one in the in the cafe downstairs.
perhaps you can talk about how tetrahedron uh, as a as a form as a unit informed this wider aura of your practice so the the tetrahedron i've been on this this journey with the tetrahedron it's been this most amazing kind of voyage i, I um it keeps because it keeps on giving and i keep discovering things about it that that baffle me and confuse me and um and also just it's just such a rich vein i originally uh, and it's a really good example of, of sort of teaching, how important teaching is, because when I studied, the, when I was first taught about the, the platonic solids at school, at primary school, I was told there were five of them, they had this number of sides, and that was it. But when they were recontextualized, and I think actually I'm incredibly um, flattered, my maths teacher is here, Mr. Jones Parry, who came from, and I think he was the one who actually redefined them to me. Um, but they, they are actually, um, uh, they, they, it's, there's only five of them because they're the only ways you can divide the surface of a sphere up equally. And for me, this kind of completely shifted uh, what they meant because they, essentially you can, you can inflate a tetrahedron to form a sphere, uh, you can blow it up, and you can do the same with this, the cube, which seems kind of counterintuitive. And you can do the same with the dodecahedron and the, and the octahedron and the icosahedron. And they're all these radiant geometries. So I started to play around with that of pushing and pulling the forms in and out. And so that was a really interesting thing about the, but I loved the tetrahedron also because it was the symbol of the basic unit of matter. So it was like a brick. It was like the sort of quantum brick that I could use and like a solar wit I loved and rule-based artist I loved, these sort of people who took these units. And I wanted to find my own unit. So I took the tetrahedron, which was the, the most complicated shape to choose as your brick, but has less so, it's very difficult. No one builds with tetrahedrons for a reason. Um, and, uh, but it's been amazing and it's been a revelation and it's been um, bamboozling and frustrating, but, but it's been extraordinary. And they, um, and these, so yeah, I've been on this journey with them, but I, so I'm attracted to it from a conceptual and a geometric point of view. So, um, this is a bit of a tangent, but I, I, I think the tetrahedron, it is a fascinating thing. So it's somehow the most natural of the platonic solids. It's the one that most naturally exists in every dimension. The, the, the others don't generalize to all dimensions. And the cube does, but not in such a natural way as the tetrahedron, which exists equally well in other curved spaces, for example. And in fact, if you take a so-called manifold in any dimension, which is a space that locally looks like Euclidean space, and um, one of the most famous theorems of Whitehead, who's, who, who, the name attached to my chair, is that any compact model of space in any dimension can be divided up into tetrahedra, the equivalent of tetrahedra, n simplices in that dimension. But you have to bend them, but you, can, you have to bend them in a curved way. But the fact is that any reasonable space at all you're going to come across in mathematics can be so-called triangulated, can be divided up into the higher dimensional equivalent of tetrahedra. But crucially, you have to bend them, which is the fascinating thing, where you move from geometry to topology. It's a topological fact that you can do this. And then the geometry comes from, well, what shape do you have to make these tetrahedra? And when you say, when you say bend, do you mean they have curved sides or they're tetroidal? Uh, the, a, a, everything about them is curved. So you start. So, so you, could, you so you could do it in three dimensions. You start with with uh, with four points. You allowed bendy edges between them, and then you're allowed to curve the faces as well. Mm -hmm. And you have to do that in every dimension. You have to allow that curvature. Mm -hmm. James, do you want to add something? Yeah, well, that was so. All sorts of things spring to mind when I when I first saw these pieces, Conrad. I guess. Um, following on from Martin's comment, is simplicial com complexes in topology, which if you're a topology student, that's one of the first things that you learn to do is divide up your space into simplices, which are the higher dimensional versions of uh, tetrahedra, of tetrahedra, the three-dimensional um, simplex. Um, so I also work in an area called toric geometry, where, where exactly these sorts of tetrahedra and polytopes also enter into that. Um, and I, I happened to be working that, on that at the okay. time, actually, when you were moving the pieces in last <laughs> August. So that was literally the first thing that came to mind. So um, then for me, these are, these are sort of representing seven dimensional spaces that I'm interested in. And the, the three dimensional space that you're seeing, the polytope is some particular projection of that where you're seeing sort of an image of that in three dimensions, but the, the, the polytope's capturing that seven dimensional space. But I, I think, um, 
to, to answer the broader question, though, that you're asking about um, uh, about this particular topic, I mean, I think one thing we haven't touched on very much so far is the aesthetic nature of mathematics and how how important that is. Um, so there's an inscription actually outside the Mass Institute when you walk in over the, the Penrose tiling, which says to freedom and the pursuit of beauty in mathematics. Um, and so um, beauty in aesthetics is very important, particularly in sort of fundamental mathematics. And I'd say it's one of the drivers of that. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you think of, you know, what, what does a mathematician do? You might say, well, it's, you know, something to do with equations. But, you know, we don't just generate true equations. That isn't what mathematicians studying the foundations of mathematics are doing. They're interested in relationships between different areas particularly sort of striking relationships, unexpected relationships between, between different areas. And I think the sort of things that, that mathematicians are naturally drawn to and find beautiful and elegant is when you start with a very simple uh, starting point, elegant natural starting point, and you explore its consequences, particularly when there are unex unexpected consequences. So I think there's a very good example of this um, related to, to group theory. So there's the study of symmetry in maths is called group theory. And you, you, you can make an abstract definition of what a group is. So you can think of it as like rotations of an, of an object, if you want, in space. That would be an example of a group. And uh, it took around a century for mathematicians to classify the finite simple groups. So finite means they have a, it's a finite number of elements in them. And simple, but mathematicians have a habit of taking English words and then making very specific definitions around them. So simple groups has a very specific definition. It doesn't mean that they're somehow kind of simple. <laughs> and th so the surprising thing is, despite the fact that the definition of group is very simple, so you could write it in, on the board in a couple of lines, there are hugely complicated examples of these things that took a whole century to figure out. So there's this thing called the monster group, uh, which is very famous. It's absolutely enormous. So it's got something like 10 to the 53 elements in it. That's more than there are atoms in, in, on the planet. Um, and it's incredibly complicated how this group fits together and its, and its structure. And you have no idea that that structure was hidden in the original starting point. And so I, I think that's, that's the sort of thing that mathematicians find beautiful and appealing is when you take a natural, simple starting point, like your tetrahedron, and then explore the consequences of that and the, the process of discovery of trying to, to understand the consequences. Um, and I think musicians are, uh, go through a similar experience when they're writing music too, of taking a, a simple starting point and exploring its consequences. Yeah, and I, because I think it technically or um, it, realistically, I'm, I'm, not a, I'm not a sculptor. I don't, I don't take stuff away. It's an additive process. And so I take these bricks or these shapes and quite quickly from the repetition of that shape, you end up very quickly within, with, with very complex uh, situations. But it's that, quite, that kind of rapid proliferation um, into complexity through these quite simple um, progressions. But they, they're not sculptures, they are their progressive additional additions or, or ascending stacks. But it's got, obviously sculpture is an inaccurate term for, for my practice, for, the, for, the, for an art, a three-dimensional practice. But it's, um, in essence, it's an additive process. But I wanted to kind of also like bring this conversation with the building and the fact that we've been imagining, you know, like how the works would be part of the everyday social texture of students, lecturers, conference uh, panelists and, and mathematicians and researchers in Oxford, um, you know, uh, residents that uh, it would be part of their everyday. Like, I really feel romantic about the fact that, you know, in the canteen, people can have lunch with the sculptures. I think that is really um, not common in the art world. We don't have lunch with sculptures. But... Um... <laughs> can I... Go on. Oh, sorry, <laughs> sorry. I, can I just say one thing? I, I think you make a very good point about sort of the conversation between the building and the artwork. I, I might say, part of my enjoyment in it, but also I think why it works so fantastically well, 
is th this building is special. It's not a building that mathematicians just inhabit. This building was built for mathematics. And I think that really shows in the architect. The architect, Raphael Vignoli, really had a proper conversation with us about not just what a nice working condition for mathematicians, but about the nature of a building that, that, that um, facilitates mathematical interaction, that welcomes people in, that gives people a sense of the importance and the excitement of mathematics and, and sort of makes a statement to the general public, look, Mathematics isn't this dusty, dry, dead business. Look, it's, it's this exciting thing that's happening here. And part of that is um, the light and the beauty of the building, but also it's structured for interactions, but also it has mathematics embedded in it. These, are, some of you may not know, these two beautiful crystals that have been, some of you might have seen, which are ways in one hand of getting natural light into the basement, but also have real mathematical meaning. One of them has an ancient theorem of geometry, Pappus's theorem encoded into it. The other is an eigenfunction of the Laplacian that's to do with the problem of can you hear the shape of a drum. And somehow I think um, having um, Conrad's work here just extends that feeling that it, it's art for mathematics, or it's art of mathematics, it's art in relation to mathematics. And it, and it just seems to be a perfect venue for, to have that conversation with the building and the people in it. Thank you. James, would you like to add something? Thanks, Thanks Martin. Yeah, I, um, I, I fully agree, Martin. Yeah, it's almost like this building was really purpose built for this particular exhibition. But it's really a very unique exhibition, as you're saying, Fatosh, in that we have uh, art exhibits in places where students are working. So we're in L1 at the moment. This is where, you know, our first year undergraduates come every day for their lectures. There's the cafeteria outside, but then there are, there are artworks there. It's, it's also where we have our seminars. So we have, you know, mathematics seminars, people come out and, uh, you know, your axiom is right outside where students are then sitting and working on mathematics problems. Um, it's really a very unique, um, Thing. And it's, it's, hu it's hugely exciting um, to, ha to have it here. Thank you. Conrad, do you want to perhaps like walk us through the show and also share some of the context that yeah. your work has been expanding yeah, onto? I thought it would be good to just go run through some of the slides and some of the, this journey through the, the, this thinking of, of how, and how the works have progressed and arrived. So this is a really old piece that I think I did in 2005 and it's a it's the most successful failure that I've ever made, I think. <laughs> but it, but it, I, I, I put it in because I, I don't regard this as a finished artwork, but it was, I learned so much from it. And this was where I kind of had this quite hubristic thing where I made 800 tetrahedrons. And I thought, and I arrived with a truck in, in this garden and I had to put two sculptures, I had two weeks to put two sculptures together. And I started to make all, to try and work out the rules and logics of the system and then was completely bamboozled by these anarchic forms and I just couldn't find any. So it just became this sort of fiery tendrils and I was just, I had to, it basically was controlling me rather than me controlling it. And I felt very much like I was kind of not um, in, and, but I sort of made, did what I could and made this form. It was also structurally very precarious. I was also quite, and then, but this is where I discovered the Chetta Helix. It wasn't something that I, found by researching Buckminster Fuller, but I later realized that he had coined this term, the tetrahelix. And so in the middle of this, you can see this, this is formed by, there are three, there are three tetrahelixes that come off the bottom. And then I built these clusters that are all identical that I bolted on. So there's a sort of beginning attempts at modularity and sort of rulemaking. Um, but the three, but the three tetrahelixes are in the, in the core of it. I was also beginning to understand, feel frustrated that the, that the tetrahedrons in the center were the same scale as the ones on the outside. So I wanted to convey this sense of entropy or change or, or there being older tetrahedrons and younger tetrahedrons. And there's this sense of time or growth or expansion. So this one where there was no difference between the middle and the outside was, was beginning to gestate in my head, um, crystallize in my head that that wasn't correct. And, um, and then this is the first time uh, a couple of years later, I got this commission in the, the, the Ministry of Justice in 2007. And this was a little bit of a Trojan horse because I, I told the Ministry of Justice this was all about stability and, st and strength and certainty. But actually, I, it was all before the sort of financial crash and everything was feeling very <laughs> precarious. And I was, what I was really excited about was the fact that this felt very precarious. And I was like, if we add another tetrahedron to the top, the whole thing will collapse. And um, so it's this wobbly tower in the middle of the Ministry of Justice, which I still makes me smile because it's sort of 
the opposite of what they should really want to convey there. Um, but um, it's so, but it's in, so it's and it's still there. It's exciting. And it's all and it was when I worked with a, a structural engineer and the pieces in the basement in the cafe are the offcuts from these. So we had all these planks left, and I made this piece called offcut, which is on its side, but. What's exciting about when you scale the tetrahedron up is it means something so different when you see these small things on a table and you scale it up and it becomes human sized and becomes architectural or immersive. The implications of it to, the, to one's body is so different and the meaning is so different. So scale affects meaning. Um, and then, but with that piece also, it was also, there was this, again, this, ang this sort of frustration that the top was not was the same size as the bottom, and with the kind of Albertian principles, a facade in 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 Italy will be slightly bigger at the top, to make it look square to the eye. And actually, what these what I realised was I need to start messing with the geometry in order for them to look right. So then I started to expand them and create these tetrahedro tetroidal forms, which grew at these different rates and. These were very much um, computer-aided design was really instrumental in this. I'm not sure these sorts of forms would be possible without computer-aided design. It's so complex, the geometries of it all. I'm sure, I'm sure it's possible, but it's just that it's so irrational. And, it's, and the, the interesting thing about the tetrahelix, it never repeats. So it never comes back to the same point. There's all this sort of quite um, irrational stuff within these things, which which happens so quickly when, when there's so much order in that when they're on their own and so much sort of chaos when they're together. It's sort of so, it's so quick to occur. Um, and then these, all these explorations led to different growth, um, different growth rates. So there's a broad one in the background there that's accelerating at about 20% per tetrahedron. And then this is a chamfer where the, the welded edges have been um, accentuated massively to create these um, large triangles on the tips. But essentially, it's still got the, the tetrahedral dogma. The interesting thing with these is that in terms of an ascending form, where you imagine time moving up, there's a sort of weird um, contradiction in that youngest is the youngest is the eldest, and the largest is the, small, is the youngest. So you've got this sort of strange counterintuitiveness where which is kind of, which is sort of, which is, I, I think, makes it more exciting sculpturally rather than the largest being the oldest. So you have this sort of almost like a reversal. Um, and then so we've, we've just, we've basically put all my artist proofs throughout the show. There's like 16 of these paradigms dotted around the thing. And Fatis and I chose all the locations. And you're right, they look wonderful here. And the context is, the, the visual context, the visual palette is great, but also just the, the conceptual context of the people who see it just is the thing that excites me. And all the, the conversations or the, the ideas that may come from them is is feels like they are they're in a really good place. Um, and then with the Matisse, which is great. I'd like to actually explore with the paradigms is that you know because we were talking mostly about like the same uh, form repeating itself, and you know you we were talking about how you could map a surface with uh, tetrahedrons or but it's like a repetition whereas with paradigms there is repetition of the form but as you said the scale is different by the way when we were installing some mathematician uh, candidates would come to us and calculate the ratio and you would be like really spooked so it's also quite interesting to kind of install an exhibition in this context because everybody wants to actually understand calculate and and measure so it was almost like a bit of a, a game yeah. but i would like to kind of contemplate on on uh, the kind of let's say as you said like the danger that you kind of almost like inherently introduce to the sculpture because as you say one more tetrahedron would make it collapse yeah, absolutely, and um, and the, the all of those all of those pieces came out of the research because I was given this commission. At, this is the Francis Crick Institute. So again, it's a it's a scientific context, and this is opposite the Eurostar in King's Cross, and um, so Sir Paul Nurse was sort of very instrumental in this, and he was very excited about this idea, and I I proposed it in to, in the in the in the sort of etymology of the word paradigm with the the Cooney and the Thomas Kuhn idea of paradigm shift and paradigm collapse and that the building behind is is trying to solve cancer and try and concertina the time that drugs get invented to hitting the shelves and try it's a it's a wonderful sort of laboratory of scientists 
Um, and so the idea, the premise of this piece, and it's a very honest sculpture, it's literally a stack of tetrahedrons bolted together. The piles go down 30 meters, the sculpture is 14 meters. And if you added another tet to the top, which would be the size of a double-decker bus, um, it, would, it would fall over. So I wanted this idea of there being this progress, but the progress implying that, that, there will, that, co that co progress leads to collapse. But the collapse is important, particularly within science, that you have to chisel away at ideas of certainty. And it, it isn't arrogant for the young, the young students to question the, 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 the things that are believed to be true, and that actually the only way that science can progress is by, by, by interrogating and cross-examining and, and questioning certainty. And this piece, so the, this, if this building was to succeed, the sculpture collapses and, that's, and progress is also intertwined with collapse. And with my head of department hat on, I was a little bit worried about the Axiom sculpture and whether that was, that was likely to topple over, especially right. if it yeah. got nudged and, and squashed an undergraduate yeah. or something. Yeah. Um, no, I think, it's, I think we've got it in a, I think it's in a good, um, it's, it's very stable. <laughs> That's good to know. And, and I have to say, these works are, are all completely underwritten by my structure engineer, who is extremely good. And, and, um, and, and um, yeah, so they're all very safe. But, but it is, I do push him hard to sort of to make f things feel like they're working very hard and their work the materials are honest there's no scaffold down the middle it is it is what it look it is it is exactly what it is and I, I don't like to sort of the, I would never do something that has a, a prop it has a prop which would be made of tin and then with a big steel bar steel girded going up it. it it is doing what it looks like it's doing and I think it wouldn't you would you can't really fake that in my mind I Go Sorry. Um, yeah, and no, I, I think, um, I mean, there's no inherent danger. I think usually with doing mathematics, it's fairly safe with a, with a pen and paper. But I, um, <laughs> but I think um, I, what I would say, though, is that it's, it's important to be ambitious in doing mathematics. And I just especially give that advice to, to young stu students who are embarking on a career in, in maths. <laughs> I think it's quite easy to become stale in your subject area where you, you, know, you work in a particular area and you, you don't venture outside of that. So I think, I think pushing yourself as a, as a mathematician is an important part of that um, process. So I, I, certainly, I certainly resonate with, yeah. with, with that. Well. And also, sadly, somehow, and I'm, like many people, I'm not good at this, knowing when to give up. <laughs> No, knowing when, you know, I haven't solved this problem in 10 years and I should probably stop. But it's, um, uh, and so maybe I'm banging my head against a brick wall that really does exist. Maybe it's not just one more idea. Maybe there actually is a natural limit to my method that isn't going to solve this problem. You know, as, you know, as there's some intrinsic difficulty that just can't be overcome. The problem can't be solved in this way. The, the, the final tetrahedron will topple it over before, before you get where you want. And on a different topic, I might say, so Conrad was saying to me earlier how ultimately the piece has, like a piece of poetry, has to speak for itself. But I must hear, say, hearing from the artist of the, the idea of the conception adds a great deal to it for me. Yes. Thank you. Do you want to kind of introduce some other works in the show and then maybe we can, you know, slowly? Um, no, thank you. Um, so this one is called Fracture and you can see that it has the sort of um, the ghost of the extrados of the form of, um, of the paradigms, but it actually it feels almost like it's shattered and it's like a light bulb that's uh, ex exploded just before it falls to the ground, and there is a we've generated a stem, a helical stem inside the the form, which rises up. That's quite easy to generate by just joining, uh, putting a perpendicular, a rod from the center of every external face, and it generates this um, this quite this this stem throughout the middle, and then from that we create the branching that um, that holds all these leaves. There's about 350 unique leaves on each one of these pieces. And um, so this was a sort of uh, a sort of evolution of the work to make them more ephemeral, to make them more ethereal, and almost like a. I wanted them to feel almost like a sort of DNA model or something, like a like a empirical model. But somehow it represents some kind of strange amino acid. But then there's very contradictory forces because within the model there's also this sense of entropy or change. There's expansion. So uh, it's a it's a model of an amino acid that contains time. 
So it sort of contradicts itself and doesn't can't be strictly defined. So it, it can never, but it, it it alludes to these things, but also and other natural formations and trees and uh, and such like. Um, but then here you sort of see it sort of as this. It's just quite difficult to see how it's. Um, and then this is a this is how this has evolved into a. It's not a, the best shot, but it's a. This is a memorial to the poet Yeats in in um, Bedford Park. And we've used these mirrored panels, and it's all about the Cloths of Heaven poem. Um, so it's sort of, I was trying to use these materi materiality to connote the, um, the lines in this thing about the dark cloths of night and light and the half light, the blue and the dim. Um, so there was all this, these, um, these, these, these specific, specific references, but when you use these mirrored panels, it, it becomes very chameleonic. So it, it disappears against, in, in the autumn, it becomes brown. In the, in, the, in, the, in the sunset, it will go, it'll, it, it takes on the pinks of the sky. In the summer, it's blue. In the winter, it becomes gray. And it's always shifting and always changing. And like a, it sort of camouflages itself against, against the, um, the weather that it's in. So it's, it's a dy dynamic piece and a kind of experiment with materials. Um, and then this is the, the, the four beacons, which are uh, studies for a piece I did in Ramsgate, which are these, these kind of optic discs, which use their sort of semaphoric beacons, which send a message out to sea, which children in Ramsgate chose. And it says home out to sea on the back and the front, but the, the back and the, they're perforated discs, which create these and they're rotating. And they, so they create these um, rotating interference patterns. Um, and then in front of that is the dappled light of the sun, which is the, the kind of um, the evolution of the one you saw in that field at the beginning, which was that my successful failure, where I've, I've kind of started to um, create these generations of the leaves so that there, there's a cascading um, generational thing as the, as the tetrahedrons emanate from the center, they cascade down and there are truncations which cascade down in scale. So this is the this is the, the this is the truncation sequence. So you see the primary, the secondary, the tertiary, the quaternary, and the quaternary tetrahedron, which uh, um, seamlessly sort of descends through these truncations. So it creates this claw, which is and is time moving inwards or is it moving outwards? Is it which which way is it going? So it's and again it has echoes of of kind of also natural formations. This this is the um, the the kind of dapp dappled light of the sun so there were three of them outside chatsworth house and so this is the the big work that um that you have in the in the common room and here again it's an example of my engineer and i working very close together because the tripod there each cloud sits on three tripods so nine legs but because of the proportions of the piece each of these clouds weighs five tons but they feel for me they feel almost like they're being tethered down because we've got the proportions right and they're sort of, they feel like they're ropes holding the work down despite their mass. That, but if we'd got those proportions wrong, it would have been, they would, could have felt very heavy and clunky. It's, and so that we spend huge amounts of time developing the, um, the way the piece um, descends. So here, the, it's all based on kind of Fibonacci and the golden section and we, the proportions of the, the edge size to the, to the decay rate it's all like scrutinized to a hundred times to get to these perfect sort of proportions or attempt to get to a sort of perfect proportion. And then this is looking up, this was in the Royal Academy courtyard. But these, and the, this, this term cascade was something that I used with these pieces, but it then informed this title because these cascading principles was a term that I liked because it, it implied this cascade of scale throughout a lot of the works. But also this idea of um, something irrational, the sort of the, a cascading principle, maybe a collapsing principle. Um, so I think we both sort of kind of honed in on that title. Yeah, you already answered actually my question about like what was your favorite work. But besides schism, is there any work that you would like to live with or something that you really enjoy seeing every day or makes you think of something different every day? Assuming that you you're here every day. <laughs> uh, that, so, so I, I, 
I, I find it sort of provocative. It, it's, a, it's a moment of, of break in the day. I, I, you do notice it. As I was saying to James just yesterday, it sort of takes my mind off the mundane administrative things. You, you see it and it doesn't necessarily give you a mathematical idea, but it makes you think, oh, it's a beautiful thing. It, it sort of turns your mind back onto mathematics, I think. So I, I get that trigger benefit for, from, from walking past any of the works. But it, it is schism that, for the reasons I articulated earlier, it is schism that resonates most deeply with me. Mm. Mm. Yeah, I agree with that. I also love the fractures one. It's just, I, it's beautiful to me. That's really beautiful sculpture. And it's, it's again, it's hard to say why you find something beautiful or elegant, but I, I, I really do, I really do like that one up, up in the common room. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, I, I've had visitors visiting last week, so collaborators who <laughs> came over from London. And the first thing that they noticed, of course, all the, oh, you, what are the sculptures? And they immediately wanted to look round at all of the sculptures and were asking me about it. And I, you know, I said that we were doing this thing this, mm -hmm. this week. And, um, you know, it's, I mean, they were my collaborators, so they were coming anyway. Mm -hmm. But it, I think the wonderful thing about the exhibition is it's bringing people to the Mass Institute who wouldn't ordinarily be here. And so that might be some of you um, here today or if, if people are watching online. And uh, it's also an opportunity just to reflect, as Martin said, even for mathematicians, it's just sitting and looking and, and thinking a little bit. Um, uh, yeah, uh, uh, reflecting really on, on, on geometry and space and so on. It's certainly as geometers, that's what drives us and our, you know, developing intuition in geometry and it's uh, you're certainly a geometer too uh, conrad and you have amazing insights um into 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 the geometry of space in, in what you do with your work well that i agree with, i i agree with a lot but i also say i think for, for we, we do try to bring a lot of young people in, into the building in particular and i think it, it is an invitation to geometry I and mean, it is you no know, why why are those forms chosen why do they fit together like that what you know, what is it about that growth that, that, that's special, that works, and so on. So I think that aspect of having them as a natural, unspoken invitation to mathematics in the building is very good, particularly for young people. I mean, I think, um, sorry, it was going to just, uh, one thing, I think a parallel between art and mathematics, I, I don't, and maybe it's true, you can confirm or deny this, but what, certainly the excitement for me about a good piece of art is that, um, it, everyone sees something different in it. So it's, it's the breadth of interpretation of a piece of poetry that's exciting to me. If everyone in the room saw the piece on the wall and they see the same thing, it's probably not a very good work piece of art. And it's the breadth of interpretation that's exciting. So maybe we can finish with the work that uh, might also kind of like interest you because this is a kinetic work. Uh, we can maybe finish with that one, uh, Conrad. The, this, this one on the rope machine. Uh, the, yeah, so um, this piece is, um, is called Slow Arc Inside a Cube. And it, it came, uh, I'd been making a lot of works that, with light and movement, but, and the shadows were always a sort of byproduct of that. And I came across a quotation from Dorothy Hodgkin when I was uh, in the Science Museum. And that's actually a point I should have made earlier. I, I spent a lot of time in the math department at the Science Museum when I was a student, when I was feeling low or um, uninspired, I would, I spent an unusual amount of time in this very 1960s kind of vitrine based room with all this psychedelic wallpaper and but incredible Victorian um, objects and contraptions. But there was a quotation from Dorothy Hodgkin um, who um, said, who, was, who pioneered this process uh, called crystal radiography. Um, and she described the process as like trying to work out the structure of a tree by only seeing its shadow. And so I was really captivated by this idea that, because it's a very humble quote about the fact that you wouldn't ever really be able to work out the structure of a tree from its shadow. And we've all sat underneath a tree with a bottle of wine and looked up at the, at the, the dappled light of the sun, but trying to imagine, you can imagine the leaves and the structure to a point, but the bark and the ants and the, and the ripples along the surface is impossible. And this, with this piece, it's a simple premise. You've got this cube and I've made a number of these versions of these over the years. Um, and it started off with just a simple cube with one layer of mesh and a light traveling from one eye to the side to the other. But over the years, I've sort of made it more complex. This one has two lights and three layers of cubes. But what's interesting is you, there's no smoke and mirrors. You see the cube, you see the layers, 
you see the light inside, but the the diff and you see in a way you have a kind of God's eye view. You can see the real, which is the cube and the shadows, which is what maybe is Plato's cave analogy. We can only see the shadows, but you as mathematicians, if you look at these shadows, would you ever be able to work out that cube from the shadows? In and principle, and. Uh, but that, but as, as an artist and as, as a mathematician or as a scientist, it's what we're all trying to do. We're all trying to see round, ingeniously see round those corners, infer what is real through very limited information. We're trying to see beyond our perception envelopes. And we also, the more we learn, we realize how flat our perception envelope is. You can slide it under the door. Um, and, um, but it's, um, and, but it's, it's the sort of that contradiction as you talked about earlier, the more we know, the less, the less we know, but, but it's also this, this feels like a really good metaphor for the human condition and for the scientific um, situation and the art. I think what we share in the science and the arts is this trying to understand what's real through repetition and through experiment and through, through um, endeavor. And I think that, um, yeah, I, th I hope that this was a nice sort of piece to end on. Thank <laughs> you.